James Ferguson, head of strategy at West House Securities, joins us in the studio. I'd love to have you on the program, James. So Morning. you say the best buying opportunities in the greenback right now. Is that mainly being driven by events in Europe or the prospects of more QE in the US? Um, it's really, I think it's being driven by almost every level that influences the currency. So the most important, as you've already alluded to, I think is probably QE. The US no longer needs to do any more QE. I'm not saying that that mm. means they won't, uh, because Bernanke might still feel it's an attractive uh, proposition if the economy mm. uh, falters, as it were. Um, but the fact is that what you need QE for is to artificially stimulate broad money supply if the banks are contracting lending. And US banks have actually been increasing lending now for the last 10 or 11 months. So there's no need any longer to do QE for that reason. In Europe, exact opposite. The, the banks that have just started to contract lending, they're just going to start to, to dig a hole, as it were, in uh, Eurozone M3. And once that happens, the authorities in the Eurozone are going to be faced with the alternative of either a deflationary depression or print more money. I think they're going to go for print more money. And so does that mean that you think the, the, the dollar is significantly well, undervalued right now? And if so, do you, how much do you expect it to rise against the euro, the yen, and perhaps even other emerging market assets? Well, the dollar's been under immense pressure, depending on exactly on how you measure it, for, well, for decades, really. But, but certainly, if you look at the last, say, 10 years or so, it's come under immense downward pressure uh, because of the crisis brewing up first in America, then because of the response to it, uh, very aggressive rate cutting. US rates were much higher than European rates uh, six years ago or so. And now they've come down to a... To a much lower level. Uh, on top of that, we've had QE. QE uh, exacerbates that uh, that pressure. So, and if you look at it in terms of commodities, say the U.S. dollar is, is probably running at 100, 110 year lows. Um, so it's it's very, very um, cheap, as it were, on a long term basis, but with justification. Uh, all those processes, though, are likely to go into reverse. Uh, the U.S. also is because the dollar is the reserve currency. The U.S. has to run a trade deficit to supply the rest of the world, or at least current account deficit, the rest of the world with enough dollars to uh, to play with. Now, on energy, we know that oil shale is likely to push uh, uh, oil imports down very aggressively over the next few years. The uh, U.S. might even reach oil independence or energy independence by 2020. And if you look at uh, the trade uh, deficit that's running with the rest of the world, that's almost entirely China. Take China out of it, and it's actually a trade surplus. So, you know, where are the trends likely to go there? Well, you know, look at Boeing's Dreamliner, lots of, of near-term pressure uh, in favour of the dollar there. So, I, I, on every front, I see the dollar improving. Interesting enough, the Dreamliner is at London Heathrow today for the first time, I think. Oh, is that? Uh, yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about this euro-dollar cross rates. Um, the correlation between euro-dollar and the European debt crisis has been, at best, tangential. We've been in, what, this 130, 134 range for really quite some time. And I'm struggling to see at the moment, short term, why there is a catalyst that is going to drive us below that. Apparently, the, the Oland victory is already priced in. Uh, we know what's going to be happening in Greece. Well, we've got a Greek election coming up, but that may, they may cause a few problems. Tell me what it is that is going to convincingly break us below that level. Well, that's really another way of posing the, 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 the more interesting part of the question, which is why, given so much crisis in Europe, has the euro held up? Okay. And the reason why, even though there's been a lot of uh, very public crisis in terms of sovereign peripheral debt, uh, the euro's held up, is that we haven't seen any contraction of bank lending. So we haven't seen any contraction of money supply, which means we've seen no reason to dilute the currency through uh, quantitative easing uh, and other yeah. methods. So therefore, the euro has been there with bad news, but no excess supply, yeah. against uh, other economies with similar levels of bad news, but lots of extra dilution. And that's pushed the dollar down against the euro, it's pushed sterling down. But there's also this relationship between risk and the dollar. When better news comes out, you sell the dollar. So if the, if the global economy gradually ratchets its way out of the hole that it's in right now, the US starts to generate better data, the banks start or, or increase lending to the, to the US economy, China doesn't get a, some sort of a hard landing, you sell the dollar on all of that. I'm not so sure. I mean, basically, when, when we've got an environment where the, 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 all the news since, you know, say, sort of 2007 has been sort of pretty bad, then basically when the news gets really bad, people uh, put aside their concerns about dilution of the dollar and just go, I just need liquidity. I yeah. need safety. And then every time that they think things don't look quite so bad, they creep out of the dollar. So that's not the same thing as to say, the reason, all I'm saying is that people haven't been buying the dollar for the last few years because they liked it. They've been buying it because right. they were scared stiff of everything else. I'm saying that from now on, we're going to start moving into a period where people are actually going to generally turn around and say, I like the look of that. I like the dollar. Buying it for different reasons. Perhaps. Buying it for different oh. reasons. Uh, and therefore, I don't think it'll be quite as simple as this old risk on, risk off thing we've got used to. I mean, more right. generally, we were just talking a few minutes ago about the ECB's liquidity measures for the banks and, and how much of an impact that's been having. Is that starting to become less effective now? Are we likely to get another round of long term funding from the ECB for the banks? Well, it's worth bearing in mind why the ECB is doing funding for the banks. It's been doing funding for the banks because the private sector has been saying, I'm not going to play any longer. 
So in other words, L LTRO, which looked to be really good, was actually uh, the, the public sector stepping in and saying, oh my God, we almost had a catastrophic disaster on our hands as everyone pulled out and we nearly had a European-wide uh, Northern Rock. So bear in mind that the LTRO is good when it happens, but it's, it's only good because it's good compared to what could have happened. Yeah. And you ought to bear in mind the backdrop to this is that banks now realise that the game's over. If the private sector won't fund me, then I have to start you know, uh, consolidating my balance sheet. And that means shedding loans, and that means Europe's about to go into this, uh, this problematical slide that we've seen in the Anglo-Saxon economies three years ago. Ongoing deleveraging problems, Nasty right? credit crunch. Thanks so much. James Ferguson of Westhouse Securities.